Awesome. Uh, I do want to clarify, there is a large aspect of this that is advanced. I'll say that. Um, I would say if you don't feel like you're ready for an advanced topic, to hang in there if you're at all interested, because the concept itself is not really advanced. It's just something that hasn't been talked about too much, and I'll cover a little bit of why. Um, so two things before we get started. One, if you'd like to follow along with my slides or catch them later, um, I've got them tweeted at Cliff Seal. I'm the only Cliff Seal on the internet, so you can go find me there, uh, and the slides are at Twitter, or you can search around on slides here if you want to. Um, two is, because of what I just mentioned about it being a pretty advanced topic but having basic applications, I would request that we not try to ask questions while I'm going through the presentation because I'm more than likely going to either answer whatever question you have pretty quickly or two, we're going to derail so hard it will be painful. So let's not do that. Um, I've got a nice flow put together for this and I have done this before and explained this to folks. So. Let's walk all the way through and let's even see if it's going to be worth it to try to do group questions at the end. More than likely what's going to be more helpful is you come meet me at the after party and we go on whatever nerd scale you want to go on and we talk about it because I really enjoy talking about this. Um, so let's try that together, okay? So the, the big idea of the full name, uh, multi-tenancy, um, what we want to do is have multiple independent instances of WordPress running off one non-hacked core directory, and I want to show you how you can possibly share themes and plugins with all of those too. Why would you want to do this? There are a lot of reasons. Some of the biggest and most obvious, uh, you can reduce your occupied disk space on your server. You actually end up reducing memory. There are a lot of other good kind of benchmarks that show that setting this up well gives you better performance, and that's nice. I'll cover a little bit more though. It gets rid of a lot of headaches. There, there's a barrier to entry for sure about how you might want to set it up and how involved you might want to be with servers, but there's a lot that comes with it. It's just kind of an interesting concept, again, that doesn't get talked about too much. So a clarifying moment though, what we're not talking about is WordPress multi-site. So WordPress.com is a giant multi-site installation. What we're talking about here is not that. So with multi-site, you have kind of this king level administrative veneer that goes over top of a bunch of uh, WordPress sites that are all inside the same database, but have a bunch of different tables and stuff like that assigned to different ones. Um, sometimes you, I, I don't know if you've ever tried to use a plugin that didn't really accommodate multi-site, but you didn't really know it didn't until everything blew up. So these are some ways around this. So this is not multi-site, but it gives us some of the benefits of some of the reasons that people do use multi-site, but is a little bit more practical for some of our examples. So uh, real quick, uh, I'm probably not selling this to anybody in the room. I just want to point out there are a couple instances of me actually being able to use what I'm talking about in real life. This isn't imaginary. It actually works really well, and I'm talking from experience about being able to set it up. Uh, so I co-founded a company called Evermore. Uh, the long and short of this, because this is not about that at all, is that multi-tenancy allows us to basically deploy a website within seconds. Uh, so you basically pick a couple of options for a WordPress site for yourself, and you get one spun up and returned back to you in completely done form. Think of, uh, think of actually getting your site set up like a demo and finally reaching that point where it looks like the theme after you bought the theme and went through the whole thing. So the whole thing gets deployed in a matter of seconds. Uh, it can be returned to people, ready to go. Um, and we're also able to manage 100% of WordPress core, plugins, themes for all the sites at one time with one central repository. So it's a slight difference than your standard WordPress hosting situation. It is not for tinkerers, it is not for developers, it's not for anybody who wants to go in and really screw up the code to know how to do that. Instead, this entire setup is built so that you can't screw up the code. So this is an interesting way to actually go about it. Uh, you can learn more if you want to at WordPress.com. Uh, another instance of, of where I've been able to use this, I actually led a pretty big company recently through the process of moving several very high traffic WordPress websites onto a multi-tenant architecture on AWS, I believe. 
So the, I'm only pointing this out so that you can know, again, this runs in production. This is not theoretical. This can do something pretty cool. It just takes some real nerd nose diving. So let's hop into it a little bit. One of the reasons we went there with Evermore, for instance, and I can use this as a good frame of reference, one of the key pieces that we wanted to do when we started that company was a lot of people can build you a website. A lot of people can kind of do the whole design your own website, get it quick and cheap, and make it your own. You've got your great website builders like Squarespace and Wix and all this kind of stuff where you can do a lot of this. But what happens is you, you end up in a proprietary walled garden for the most part. So if you ever need to do something else with your website, you can't really get all of your stuff out of it anymore. Uh, WordPress.com is actually kind of that way too. Um, and so it becomes difficult to actually move on with what you're doing. Whereas jumping all the way into, okay, now I've got to go to WordPress.org, download a zip file, unzip it, FTP up, use MySQL. Like, as soon as you start using acronyms with a lot of people, it's done, right? Just no idea. And we kind of forget a lot of times what it's like to be those people who don't know what any of those acronyms mean and have to learn how to fix things ourselves. And it's all very difficult and risky. Um, and on top of it, you know, if you've ever written a line of code, you can do something catastrophically wrong and never know you did it until something goes catastrophically wrong and you don't know how to backtrace it. So point being, what we wanted to do was create a solution where you could have all of the ease of WordPress.com or something like that. But if you ever wanted to move off the platform, you were able to get 100% of your website, not just the content, but all the themes, all the plugins, WordPress core, and get an actual zip file that you could take to a host and just say, look, can you just plop this up on the server for me? Because most of them will do it if you'll actually give them the files that they need to make it happen. So we went this route and I started exploring this from a technical perspective because I wasn't really happy with any of the situations. The thought of using one of those WordPress management plugins to manage hundreds of thousands of sites was unwieldy. So I went looking for a better way, basically. So for your cases, though, you know, if you're building a network of sites and you need people to launch their own within that and you need control over that sort of thing, use multi-site, and that's perfectly fine. Otherwise, multi-tenancy can offer several other um, So instead of doing individual installations for all of your different WordPress websites, you get a smaller footprint on your server, you get faster code deployment. I'll cover that a little bit more in a second. Uh, use your updating process, which is pretty much the same thing. Uh, and you can also, again, use single instances of themes and plugins. Um, so uh, I'll cover this a little bit more in a second, but just as a for instance. So think a huge server, a bunch of websites that might not all be high traffic or something like that. So if you know how to tune a server well and you've got a lot of resources on that server, you can put a ton of websites on it. It takes two lines of code to update WordPress for all of the sites on any number of servers at one time. It happens instantaneously. So there's no, there's no waiting for WordPress to kind of update itself because of the way we're able to set this up with one repository. Further, if you've ever run several sites for one group of people and they really are all sharing the same types of themes and plugins or you've got a common set of themes and plugins you use for folks, if all the sites are on the same server, you can actually keep one updated version of your themes or your plugins in one folder. So you don't have to go into all those individual sites and update them there, deal with any errors that come up, deal with all the, you know, one headache is having to apply your license to all the individual sites. You don't have to do that anymore if you set it up this way. So there's a ton of advantages that come from this. Um, but again, if you're looking for something that multi-site was built to do, do it. Otherwise, consider not doing it because it is a major headache. So if you Google WordPress multi-tenancy, you will get a lot of very bad ideas. Um, bad, bad, bad. Um, and the, the problem, though, is that they weren't bad when they started. Um, they're bad ideas now, and they were good ideas from very smart people who were trying to figure out how to do this before WordPress would actually really support the ability to do all of this. Um, so smart people, I mean, the people you find, again, for the most part, very intelligent people, people who are doing very smart things with WordPress these days, um, but the way that they were going about them, 
uh, back then it, it, it's not necessary anymore. So some best practices have emerged for doing some things like this, but in WordPress 3.9, this became a fully supported idea to be able to run single repositories for not just WordPress core, but also for themes and plugins and things like that. Um, and so that's why you'll see a lot of old bad ideas that seem very complex and complicated. And it's why I'm talking about introducing mul uh, WordPress multi-tenancy. It's not really a new idea. I didn't come up with it, but I bared down on it a lot after WordPress started supporting it. And so there's not a lot out there for you to look at. So that's why I'm kind of throwing it out there as a warning in case you get more interested. Something else that helped with this process, which I'll point out a little bit later as well, um, once WordPress core started getting mirrored onto GitHub and being a little bit easier to use than SVN, it became a lot easier to deal with this single repository. So when I said that we were using to update WordPress across all the sites that were there, so that's because we have the Git repository checked out. And again, sorry, sometimes we're going to nerd out and we'll come back, okay? But we have the Git repository checked out on the server itself. And so when WordPress tags a release, we're able to go in there and say, just pull all the files and check it out. It's nearly instantaneous. There's no deal where WordPress has to go and update itself and basically uploads its own files into itself and overwrites things. So you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. Instead, it is, again, almost instantaneous. So this is how the big idea works, literally, for us. Um, it, by the way, the other reason I brought up Evermore for you, so if you would just like to take my business model entirely and do it yourself, I'm about to tell you how to do it. Because that's what I believe this community is all about. It's Russ, and the password is like rock on dude or something like that. So, yeah, just keep trying until you get it. There's like an exclamation point at the end. So, yeah. So, um, these, these names, slightly, so to speak, have been changed to protect the innocent. But I'm basically giving you the shell of how things are actually set up on the server. And I'm going to explain this, okay? So, the, the bolded files, the bolded names here are actual files or directories on our server. So, um, for each site, you've got an index file, a config file content folder and an uploads folder. So that is all that actually is required to create a new WordPress website when you do it this way. You'll need a database, obviously, but beyond that, when it comes to literal files, this is all you need. You don't need that whole WordPress directory being uploaded with all of those files and all of that craziness involved. Um, so everything else here is what we call a symlink, which stands for symbolic link which if you have your server configured properly, which most of them are, but good grief, servers are crazy, so you might have trouble. Um, but symlinks basically say, I'm gonna put this little symbol here, so to speak, and the server is going to know that the folder I'm talking about is somewhere else entirely. So what we're doing here inside each site folder is we're saying, look here for WordPress, because with WordPress it's supported to where you can install it in a subdirectory. Okay, so you can put WordPress inside the site's uh, root folder and get all of your files there. You can do that for any number of reasons. But what we're doing here is we're telling it, actually look somewhere else on the server. And this points to the one actual core repository of WordPress that we have. With these others, we're doing the same thing with MU plugins, plugins, and themes. We're saying look somewhere else entirely for the folder. Because what we're able to do at that point is have one folder with all the themes and all the plugins totally updated at all points and set up to where, again, going nerdy for just a second, we can really lock down security because you can't go in there and FTP anything. It's highly secure because the only way you can do anything with files in that directory is by pushing to it through a Git remote or a deployment process or something like that. So by setting it up this way, you can have those kind of advanced deployment processes that you want to have and it doesn't take forever, because there's only one folder for this stuff. So I'll show you a little bit more about what's involved, but all you're really doing here is taking advantage of the fact that WordPress will let you run itself in a subdirectory, and then we're just getting smart about the fact that WordPress allows us to use these symbolic links to point to different places. So literally, here is what is in those files that we're talking about. So this is all that gets deployed when a new site gets set up. The index file, all we're doing here 
is you'll notice one little thing has to get edited. We have to tell it to look for WordPress in its little WordPress subdirectory. Um, again, this is a supported thing from WordPress. You can look this up on the codex. This is a, a thing that they allow. The only thing that we're doing differently is with these symbolic links. So the index file has this, and it tells WordPress where to look for itself, basically. The config file that we have here does things to be heavy-handed on purpose, um, but if you have your server set up the right way, again, this allows you to deploy things almost instantly. So we're gonna tell we're gonna tell WordPress to look in specific places for specific things there in the config file. Uh, so we're telling it where to look for. Uh, we're telling it what the URL is. So in this case, all the folders are named whatever the domain is that we want to use. So if it's example.com, that's the name of the root folder. So we can actually tell WordPress, just grab the name of that folder or whatever. That's going to be the name of it. Um, you'll see where it's looking for WordPress, it's got a slash and a WP. So look for WordPress there. And then we're also telling it where to look for content directory. And so we do that because we don't want to name it content. Content is cleaner, uh, and so we would rather it look there, and so we can be a little bit more explicit about what's involved. And so we can take advantage here of these little server variables that come with PHP um, that allow us to kind of tell it different things. So again, not a huge deal. You can do a lot of different things differently here, but in our case, what I'm trying to show you is how once you get an idea of how the whole thing works together, things become very quick and easy to deploy. So what's in the content directory? So I mentioned that we do in fact have a real content folder and then a real uploads folder on the server. Um, we, we leave it there because each individual site needs its own uploads folder, right? So it doesn't need its own version of WordPress because all those files are the same. In our case, they don't need their own versions of themes and plugins because they don't upload their own. They use what's available. So uploads is the only truly unique folder. In our case, we actually use a CDN for uploads, um, but you could leave that there because that's all it really needs to be able to have. Um, and again, the, the other sim links, so MU plugins, plugins, and themes, they just point to single directories on the server containing one copy of all that stuff that we need. So because these are source controlled, what this also allows us to do is we can replicate the entire server locally, test out plugins before we push them, update them in one place, basically on a, just imagine a test WordPress install, a very vanilla one. Update them there, make sure they work, and then push them up to the servers and they get done. So in the WP directory, uh, there's only really one thing that needs to be changed and we don't, we're not, again, we're, we're creating non-hacked core files, so we're not hacking anything. What we're gonna do instead is, when you set up your WordPress installation, no matter how you do it, no matter whether we're talking about what we are here or not, you end up plugging in your database details and WordPress helps you create a WP config file, okay? So what we're doing with ours, um, inside that single instance of WordPress core files, we're just telling it, look, don't, don't look for the config file, look somewhere else. Go grab the config from the individual site. So that then, these things that we pull in, get pulled into the configuration, okay? So, yeah, and as well, because, uh, because we've created a file that's outside of the source control for WordPress, we can go in and we can use git and check out all the files and do everything we want to deploy this stuff very quickly and it never gets overridden because it's a file that's not source controlled. Okay, so, man, this is dry, right? This is super fun. But again, if you've ever had to do server stuff, this is really cool. And again, I really hope that if you're making it through this and you're like, I really shouldn't have sat here and I would feel very bad about getting up while this guy is talking. First of all, don't feel bad. If you want to get up, you can. That's fine, hey. I know who you are, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. No, um, but, but seriously, um, I think expanding the way that we think about WordPress is helpful, even if it's not applicable according to where we are. If you had told me five years ago that I was gonna be talking about something like this, I would have laughed hysterically at you. But instead, because I just did so many WordPress websites, I got interested in being able to apply some of this stuff, figure out how to make my workflows easier, and make things better for customers. So hang in there with me, okay? So we use, like I mentioned, a, a GitHub mirror. Um, 
as the remote here so that we have a controlled version of WordPress checked out on the server. So think about whenever this was. Last week, I think it was? Yeah. So last week, 4.3.1 came out. It's a security release. So as on Evermore and with the other large company that I mentioned and other, other places where we've run a multi-tenant architecture, and we need to be updating these sites immediately because it's either something customers are paying us for or it's a big company that needs to be secured, right? So all we have to do at this point is just hop into a server. We can even, we could do it manually, theoretically, or you can run a script. And all we're saying is like, look, GitHub, fetch me the tags here because WordPress tags each version. So go ahead and grab that for me and check it out. So Git's checkout runs a lot better than trying to do some sort of FTP upload or doing some weird R syncing or something like that and trying to throw files from your computer up to it. Instead, Git just runs it for you. It checks it out automatically. And now, you know, if you had 100 sites on a server and they're all running off this, now they're all immediately running off the latest version of WordPress. If they need to upgrade their database, which you may have seen before, WordPress handles that gracefully. So you don't have to worry about any of that. So again, if you've ever tried to you know, have to emergency fix a situation with a site where you need to update it to the latest version and you've had to upload you know, 30 individual directories of WordPress to something before, this ends up being really cool. It's got a little bit of headspace you've got to get into to figure out how to do it. But once you've done this, like this, this is a glorious moment. Okay? I, I updated massive amounts of sites from San Francisco from a conference with bad Wi-Fi last week, just because I could, because this is how easy it is. Okay? So, and then also, by the way, if something comes out that's bad, if it breaks something, it becomes another line just to revert the whole thing. So you're able to do that with WordPress in case something rolls out that's bad. Like, you, you just have so much more emergency stability, so to speak, with this sort of setup, okay? As well, if you do this with, um, with the content directories that we mentioned, so with themes and plugins and things like that, um, you know, if you've, if you've ever uploaded a, uh, or updated a plugin and it breaks your site terribly, one of the only ways you can really do that, or you've got a couple of ways and they're all very bad and they all make you feel very hacky. You know, one of them is going in and changing the name of the folder so the plugin deactivates itself, or you've got to FTP the old version on top of the new version, or something like that. Like, everything is a, it's this huge moment of panic because your client's site probably is white screening, or yours is. Someone is losing money, someone is upset, or is about to be upset, and you're frantically figuring out how to fix this situation. But with source control, when you're pushing to one repository and you're updating those plugins, if you find out it breaks something, again, it's one line to go back in and say, you just take that back for now. Don't push that update. We've got to figure out what's going on. Everything's returned back to normal. You retain all of your history and all the rest of this stuff. You get all the benefits of source control that you would normally get, etc. So it's just a, a much safer way to do servers. Again, it's got kind of a uh, barrier of entry to get into, but once you get there, it becomes so much more graceful and you can be so much more confident making changes to a website because you can, you can hardly break it for very long um, because things become instantaneously reversible, okay? So, basically all we've been able to do at this point from this is to just combine everything that we just talked about and you can do the same thing. You write a script. You can create new sites on the fly. Create a script to update WordPress whenever something comes out. You can set triggers for yourself and then run that script on the server whenever you want to. You can do a number of things. So everything that we just talked about, creating a new folder, adding these files, because of the way that they were written, because you'll notice I've never written anything explicit, like example.com in it, right? Because nothing specific was ever written, this is a totally repeatable process that's not tied to any specific information. So you can just throw new websites on the server with almost no effort whatsoever once you put everything together. So I do want to tell you some things that you should look out for. So you, you do get to avoid the awkward multi-site bad plug-in situation where they just all of a sudden don't support multi-site somehow and everything breaks. However, you find a new echelon of screwing up code uh, when you do it this way. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So, um, and here's kind of a pro
pro tip for you, I guess, if you're a plugin or a theme developer, um, you should never ever assume that there is a folder called wp-content and that it is, you know, one level down from the root of the folder. So because this is the standard way that WordPress directories come when you download them, it's safe to assume that or you feel like it is. But WordPress supports having WordPress put together in very different ways. WordPress provides you all the functions to not have to write that kind of thing explicitly. And so what happens when you set this up is you find out a lot of plugins have done exactly that. And so everything breaks wildly or all of a sudden, you know, we can't find any scripts or any images or anything like that from the, from the plugins. Um, so what I've been able to do is send patches to a ton of plugins and help them write better code because we figured out they were probably doing something they shouldn't to begin with. Um, so again, assuming that WordPress is set up a certain way is not a safe way to write it and you will have a terrible time dealing with support tickets. Um, and in a couple of individual cases, some people have just flat out refused to update their plugin or fix it despite it being a totally supported situation. So you will have that to, to look out for, but most of the time you can, you can figure that out pretty easily. Um, when, you, when you use plugins as a symlink and you have a single repository of plugins uh, on your server here, um, make sure you always put your in a directory. So most plugins come this way anyway. It's you know, your plugin name, and then there's usually a file under it, at least one file, that runs the plugin information and things like that. Um, from time to time, there can be trouble if you set up only an individual plugin file without a directory and you're using all these sim links and things like that. Um, lastly, test deployment processes for multiple production servers. Um, you, if you actually do implement this, again, you'll gain countless hours in return once you actually get things set up and are able to take advantage of this if it's a process that works for you. Um, but the downside of being able to change everything so quickly and so easily is that you can also break everything immediately. Um, so WordPress VIP actually came back time in 2010 because they basically um, and, and everything kind of went down at one time. Now again, you can reverse everything very quickly but you have all that power to now push basically bad code to everything all at once. So if you do set this up, especially if you have multiple production servers, make sure you're testing all of that stuff um, so that you can make sure it's easy to figure it out. Um, and also I mentioned that thing about WordPress VIP. I mentioned earlier, if you start Google around for how to do this, you're gonna find some really bad information. There's at least three articles that are like, this is the worst idea ever, and the thing that happened in 2020 is exactly that. So, this is another reason I'm presenting on this now, because it's extreme, it's as dry as the weather outside is right now. But it's so useful, and it's so helpful, and it doesn't get talked about because it got a bad rep before WordPress kind of came into its own on allowing this to work this way, um, that people shied away from it and not a lot of worked on it. Um, and honestly, even shared hosting environments and things like that could really benefit from this if they wanted to. It's just kind of scary territory to get into. So, for the most part, that is it. That is kind of how you can set up multi-tenancy. This is a pretty common practice outside of WordPress um, because we're a friendly community full of people who are all learning. We don't tend to have a ton of exposure to actual application building DevOps people. This is not uncommon anywhere else. This is only kind of uncommon with us because we're all tinkerers, we all want to learn, and we all start very simplistic. Once you get past that and you're running a lot of websites or you're running website systems for people, things like this become very advantageous and give you the opportunity to run huge networks of sites that don't have to be hamstrung by multi-site. So thank you, and again, I think We've got, a, we've got a little bit of time, so if you guys have questions, we can try them. Um, but again, it might just be best to have a couple of beers in you so that, you know, so that if we start answering these questions and you just want to be like, you know, I just, I give up, um, that, then you feel a little bit better about that. So, okay. So any questions for now? Yeah. Oh, we got a brave one. Okay. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. 
worked for a long time. Mm -hmm. so thank you. For that. Thank you. Uh, my question would be if you have like, let's say, 3,000 sites that still great, mm -hmm. and, and you do an upgrade like this, uh, and there's a database of great, mm -hmm. would you still need to go through each site and do the database of great process, or how would you manage that? Yeah, so this is a. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing he said was that I was very good looking and I told him thank you. Um, the, the thing he asked after that uh, was I think related to whether a database breaks when you have a lot of websites. So the cool slash interesting thing about this is that it's very agnostic towards databases. So it doesn't change anything about the way that those are managed or handled. So none of this process touches them differently. Each you know, each site has a database the same way you would describe it. Yeah, so, if you're upgrading the file system mm -hmm. and there's a database upgrade, mm -hmm. then you'll need to go to each back office and do the database. I see what you're saying. Yes. Okay, so you're asking about when it does need a manual database upgrade and it prevents, presents you with that little screen. Yeah. Need, yes. Um, so, there are a couple of ways to handle it. Um, for us, we just leave it there. So everyone's got to log into their site at some point. They'll come to it. They'll click a button. They won't know what happens because that process is super weird, um, but they'll walk through it. There are some versions out there of, um, of multi-tenancy and some other things on, on GitHub you might find where they'll present you with a way to basically defer that if you want to. So you can allow customers to be able to access the site without doing the database update because a lot of times it's honestly just kind of keeping a record for its own good. So, but yeah, there's no good way to handle that part of it. Okay, cool. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for hanging in there with me. Again, let me know if I can answer any questions. I look forward to bearing with you later. Thank you.